Hi, I'm Donnie. And I'm Esther. We'd like to welcome you to SAC during this time of social distancing. Oh, and if you're new, uh, please mention it in the chat box below and we'll make sure to give you a warm welcome. We'd also like to invite you to join us for a discussion on race and injustice after service today from 11.30 to 12.30. And for more details on that or other general announcements, um, please see below. And there's one more thing that I forgot that we're supposed to mention. What was it? Uh, it is to smash that like button and click the bell for notifications for more sermons every week. Thank you for joining us today and uh, please make sure to turn off any distractions you may have and prepare your heart for worship. You can buy, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great.
Show. Sure. 
Good Sunday morning, church. It's great to be with you all this morning. It's summer. It's beautiful. I know it's, as Seattleites, we have to get outside. So when you do, just remember to keep those hands washed and to wear a face mask as a loving thing to do for yourself and for your neighbor. We're in the fifth week of our series called Undivided, Searching for a Gospel That Makes Us Whole. Last week, I did a message called Why Do Asian American Christians Need to Talk About Race at Church? Why? Number one, racial superiority is not the heart of God. Number two, Asian American Christians have traditionally been silent on the issues of race, and there's historical reasons for that. And number three, that undoing racism is a gospel 
imperative. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to the message, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's a very important one in the particular conversation of this series. Today we have an Asian American panel discussing issues of race pertinent to Asian Americans. On the panel, we have Pastor Nancy Sugikawa. She's the pa associate pastor at Lighthouse Church in Bellevue. She is Japanese Taiwanese American. We have Reverend Dr. Mark Hearn, who's associate professor and director of contextual education at Church Divinity School of the Pacific in Berkeley, California. And we have Kelly Aramaki, who is the executive director of, uh, of schools for Bellevue School District. He also attends Faith Bible Church in the Central District. These are all trusted friends, uh, key spiritual leaders in our community. I trust you find today's conversation both enlightening and healing for your soul. All right, I wanna thank you guys for being here this morning. And so we're gonna start off with a rapid question, okay? All right, the first question is, when did you first notice you were Asian? When did you first notice that people saw you differently from how you saw yourself? I'll go with you, start with you, Mark. Uh, sure, it, it was in elementary school. I think it was a really painful, actually, experience uh, that I realized that I was Asian, and that was, uh, I was driving in the car with my mother, and um, she was trying to make a turn into the gas station, and when she didn't go fast enough, she, the, she finally made the turn and the car went by. This young guy was in the car and he started throwing all these expletives uh, at my mother uh, about her being an Asian driver, an Asian woman driver. And I was probably about seven or eight at the time and that just really was painful for me because I, I saw that it was painful for my mother. So I mean, in that sense, like in a negative sense, that's when I first realized that I was Asian. And then I think that later on in years, uh, I was able to put language around that. Um, but it was a lot of, of times around these, uh, I think, uh, more negative experiences, and painful experiences. Yeah, so before, yeah. How about you, Kelly? You know that first memory? Yeah, it w wasn't so much that I, the first time I realized I was Asian, but it's the first time I realized I was different. Um, it was elementary school, first day of kindergarten. So I think I, wow. I didn't realize that I was anything different until the first day of school. Excited to be there. My mom and dad, they packed me a lunch. Um, but I like, have vivid memories of them putting my little rice ball and something else in a big kind of QFC paper bag, put my name on it, and then um, I get to school and the teacher tells all of us to put our lunches into the lunch bin. And <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, just imagining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, your kids are, I mean, we're pretty perceptive, you know, so everyone's got the cute little white bag, the little paper bags, or the little brown bags with their names on it. But they're all little, the little lunch bags, or the little lunch box. So that everyone's putting them in, and then I just knew <laughs> something was different about me. So I put this big old QFC bag in the thing. Yeah, the plastic bag. Just the regular. Well, it was a big paper bag. Oh, a big paper it's the bag. big paper bag. The big paper bag. Yeah. So yours was the big, yeah. So then I'm just like, mm. then I was like, uh oh. I mean, oh, seriously, it was like warning signs all over the place for me. And then when we went to lunch, I was like, oh. I, I mean, by then I knew that I was different because everyone's taking out their lunches and the kids all have the same stuff. I mean, they've all got peanut butter jelly sandwiches or turkey sandwiches. And, uh, you know, I had this little thing of rice and the kids are asking me what that is and I'm just like oh my god and then I went home I was so upset I told my parents that I need to get different lunch bags they got to be the same as everybody else so I knew I was different I don't know I'm not exactly sure when I realized I was Asian Asian um, but I think all through elementary school there were I mean lots of instances where kids would say something about me being Asian or making fun of the shoes that I got from my Korean grandfather <laughs> Korea. <laughs> First time I wore them, last time I wore them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I have a, a really vivid memory of when I was in elementary school walking through Issaquah. My dad has a shop in Gilman Village and I'm just walking and I see a family come in, two kids, two parents white. And one of the kids said, go back to China, China man. And the parents started laughing and I was 
really stunned. I mean, that's like my first like kind of racial like kind of experience of like outright like kind of racial comment by a kid, but in front of the parents. So, wow. anyways, that all happened kind of elementary school. Yeah. How about you, Nancy? Yeah. So I'm gonna be a lot of a little bit of the oddball, but um, yeah. First, so I I grew up in Hawaii, which is pretty diverse. Uh, place. So I think we just grew up very aware of ethnicity because everybody was different, you know. And so um, we learned very quickly, you know, whose parents could make good kimchi, whose parents <laughs> could make good fried chicken. You know? <laughs> and, and I think ethnicities were associated with food and culture and language. And so, and so I didn't see it as a negative thing, but just aware of differences. And then, and then my family was military, so we lived in different places. So we lived in Asia, we lived in Taiwan, uh, we lived in Okinawa, then we lived in Texas and Missouri. So I always knew that, you know, when I was in Texas or Missouri, most people were white, you know, but when we lived in, you know, Okinawa, we were the odd people, we were the Americans, you know, or if we lived in, Taiwan, it was a mix because my mom was from Taiwan, but we were from Hawaii. So there was always an awareness of, of culture and language um, and differences, but it wasn't necessarily a, a negative thing. But I do have one funny memory though, is um, we grew up you know, often on the military base in, in Missouri, we were there and um, I had a best friend during that time and it was, wasn't until high school that I have found these old uh, family albums. So I was opening the album and I see, you know, pictures of us as kids. And then I see this little um, black girl with, you know, po pony pigtails and stuff like that. And I go, I see a little, little girl and a little boy. And I go, who's, who's that? I'm in high school. And my mom's like, what do you mean who's that? I go, who, who, who is that? I mean, there's all these family and Asian people and here's this little black little girl. And she goes, you don't know who that is? I go, I have no idea. She goes, that's your best friend, Sherry. I go, that's Sherry? And it just never oh. occurred to me that she was black. And I go, I looked at the boy and I go, and that's Earl? Because yeah, Earl used to babysit me. So not a clue. So it's sort of a testimony that kids really are colorblind in some way. But I didn't figure that out be until high school. And mm. so all of a sudden it's like, Wow, that's, that's so bizarre. Like I had another friend when we lived in Texas and I knew he was white, but the reason why I knew he was white is because his grandfather wore a cowboy hat and he had spurs on and he was a cowboy, which I saw in the movies. So I knew he was white. <laughs> you know? So yeah, so I remember him vividly being white, but Sherry, you know, and that was when I was in uh, kindergarten, but Sherry was when I was three or four and and no clue. Yeah, yeah it kind of sounds to me like it's because we, a lot of us who grew in the U.S., Asian American group, yes, we have that distinct moment mm -hmm. where we found that, oh, I'm Asian. Mm -hmm. Like, or someone's seeing me differently yeah. than how I saw myself. I just saw myself as a normal kid. I'm, I'm probably American. I'm, you know, it did, had that, didn't have that distinguishing factor of race. Because you're in Hawaii and there's so many ethnicities of Asians, different mm -hmm. kinds of Asians, right? So there wasn't, there wasn't that aha it's like if we were kids and we never had we never had that moment where oh I'm I'm different, you know I'm I'm eight and, and I'm Asian and marked in a different way. So you didn't have that until all the way until you were, like you said, high school, and realizing your friend was black. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. That's really that's pretty amazing. I mean, yeah. it, in some ways, you know, I feel like there's there's ho it's hopeful. In yeah, that sense no, there is it that is. you know. I don't know if you, you know, that when kids are growing up, that it, if things are normalized, you know, maybe there isn't that sense of the other, you know, yeah. if, if we're all in community together. Right. Pretty, pretty powerful. Pretty mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. I think that idea of like, I'm American, um, growing up in, in America, I think that was a, I think it was a big theme mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. Asian Americans. Um, and so we, we said the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, we, we, we learned. And when you, I don't think they teach history as much 
now, you know, in elementary school, but I still remember learning about history and like Jamestown and things like that. And when you're, when you're a little kid, you're just presented like, oh, that's my history too. I yeah. guess, you yeah. know, I mean, you, you don't, don't really question it. Yeah. 13 years of the colleagues, I guess my ancestors are there, you know, they, they weren't, right? But you, you, as a kid, you do grow up this sense like, oh, I'm American. And then so when you finally figure out like, oh, you're Asian or other people see you differently, then it really messes up with your, messes with your sense of identity. Like, am I Asian or am I American, you know? And then trying to figure that piece out, where, where do I fit? Well, you know, it's interesting, I grew up and I, I remember having conversations with my father, and he would say, you're Korean. I said, no, I'm American. He said, no, you're Korean. I said, no, I'm American. And then eventually he came to, okay, I'm Korean-American. You know, I think what's really cool nowadays, though, is that my daughter, who is you know, uh, 12 going 13, she has very much a sense of her Korean identity. And I think a lot of that is, is kind of the advent of, of social media, YouTube, being able to be access as well as kind of just a different curriculum, I think, that she grew up with. I mean, I, I, I didn't know any of the history either, Asian American history, until I studied it during my PhD work. And a lot of that was because it was never taught. I didn't have access to it. I didn't even know that it existed, right? So whereas my daughter, I think she has a lot more access to that now and opportunity that her, her identity is very Korean now, you know, and so, um, and we're really proud of that. That's know? really cool. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You had the same conversation with my dad, too. Yeah, I'm American. <laughs> no, you're Chinese, but you need to act American. <laughs> you, know, you need to act American, but you're Chinese. I'm like, I don't want to act Chinese. And I, don't want, I need to act American, you know. Yeah. There is that thing. I, think, I do think that it's unique, I think, to Asians. But this idea that we're not American, you know, that there's mm -hmm. a foreignness to Asians, whether you've been here, you know, for a century, you know, or, or even recently. I think that is a common thing. But it's interesting because my conversation with my dad is um, I'm, I'm telling him I'm Japanese and he's telling me, no, you're American. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something about mm -hmm. post-World War II. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's like, you're American. And then. I said, but what American? Because in school, we're supposed to say if we're mm. Japanese American or Italian American. He's like, you're, you just tell them you're American. Mm -hmm. If you have to say anything else, then you can say American of Japanese and Korean descent, mm. if you have to. But if someone asks you, what are you? You say you're American. So it's interesting. Yeah. I think it depends on when the mm -hmm. group came over to the mm -hmm. States, how much they you know, hold on to the, the pride of culture. But yeah, it's interesting to hear. It was act American, but you, it's because you are yeah. American. Part, I mean, just part of my own study of especially what happened to Japanese uh, with the internment camps and post-internment, post -internment, the whole relocation was process. wasn't just about finding you, where you're going to stay or where you're going to live. It was about assimilation. And so it seems to me that the Japanese, out of all the Asian culture, like even beyond Chinese and Korean, they were really pressed with the assimilation ideas. And the assimilation ideas were very similar, like you're, you're, you have to be American, mm -hmm. uh, identify as American, and all the values of, like you said, like don't, don't be loud, no, no big groups, keep yourself quiet, you know, keep your head low. Those things were like really pressed upon the Asian Americans more than all the other Asian races. I think that's also partly because that's the, the culture, actually the Japanese culture is like that, you know, because I always thought I was, you know, typical American until I went to Japan for the first time. And I'm like, I am so Japanese. <laughs> I am so Japanese, right? Because I think they brought that because our parents, my parents were, you know, my dad was that bicultural, right? He, he, his parents were from Japan, but he was born in the U.S. So he's kind of that first generation, or we, we used to call it, we call it second generation, but born in the U.S. So, so he still grew up with that first generation values. Uh, and the Japanese values are top down, right? If the mm -hmm. emperor says this, you do it. If your boss says this, you do it. If the pastor, the priest says this, you do it, right? There's no talk yeah, back. Very top down, yeah, it's very top down. To authority. Yeah, and which is why, you know, my understanding is the reason why people went into the relocation camps is, hey, if the president says we got to do it, you just listen, just obey, you know, you be a good subject, subordinate, to the leaders and you just do and everything will be fine. Yeah, I think that's the kind of, the, that's a 
transitioned into some of our conversation about model minority because I do yeah. think some of that comes from some of the cultural mm -hmm. values of some of the Asian countries, you know, Confucianism and things like that, where mm -hmm. like following authority, valuing harmony, mm -hmm. not creating conflict and things like that. Yeah, and then but then all and and then also at the same time the the other side of what you're talking about with the kind of the perpetual foreigner, forever foreigner, mm -hmm. right? Like no matter how many years you're here, you'll always be asked, well, you know, where's home for you, right? Or where are you from? Yeah. Right? Those ideas coupled with I think this idea that at least in our parents' generation, it was like you got to assimilate as much as possible. So it was interesting because even though my father and I had these conversations at home. Man, he tried really hard and it succeeded in a lot of ways to assimilate. I mean, even my last name, Hearn, mm -hmm. is not Korean. It's yeah. Han. And the part of that, he, there were many different reasons. One of the reasons was so that at least on paper, I wouldn't be discriminated against. He wouldn't be discriminated or his future family wouldn't be discriminated against. So he did, and he, he spoke really hard to get rid of his accent, right, in English. And so he didn't force us kids to learn Korean. Because he didn't, he wanted us to be able to have great opportunities, and then to be able to ace the interview whenever we had that, if it was by phone. So these little things, I think, that he did to assimilate, and yet at home, there was still this question of, you know, like you know, you, it was never said, but it was almost the 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 intent was, you know, you'll never be accepted here, right, as fully American. So you got to accept that you're Korean. So why do you think Asian uh, American Christians have been so silent around the issues of race? I think for, for myself, um, you know, my mom was the first Christian in our family and, and took us to church and we went to a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church. And, but this is, um, I think this was in one of the military bases somewhere. <laughs> You know, and so, and I always asked her why she chose to be Baptist, you know, <laughs> and she just thought, you know, she said, well, I did a lot of things in my life, so I need the full immersion. <laughs> I needed to be dunked, and that's how we ended up being Baptist. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the Baptist churches were, were, were white, where we were, you know, when we lived in, you know, Texas and Missouri, they were pretty white, and, um, and I think that's still the dominant was the dominant culture in the military as well. So that was no big thing for us. On the military basis, m most of the people were white. Um, so I think we learned our theology from the white church, you know, and, and, uh, or from the European, you know, that mm -hmm. line of, of theology. So um, I, I think this whole um, idea of, of even social justice um, by the time, you know, we were in the church, or my, my mom was in the church, um, this is when there was a divide, right, between the social justice and the church. You know, long ago, it was the church was, did the social, you know, uh, services, right? It mm -hmm. was through the church, but then there was that divide in, in the 50s or so, right? So, um, so we're all about the gospel, you know, just help people to know Jesus, you know, and, and we didn't, it wasn't whether they were poor or they didn't have things to eat. It's like, well, God will take care of that. First thing we need is to help them to know Jesus. That's our focus. Let other people take care of feeding and clothing and housing the poor. We have to make sure that they know Jesus. And so that was our focus uh, growing up. And so there was, you know, there was no language or conversation or discussion about issues of justice, you know, and, and, no one talked about it. I don't remember anyone talking about anything like that. Yeah. Do you, you guys know? ever can remember going to church and hearing a sermon on race? Oh no, yeah. And then, and then I think the poverty that we heard about was global poverty, right? It right. was the poor in China at the time who <laughs> didn't have food, <laughs> or you know, or or yeah, Ethiopia yeah. or Africa, or you yeah, know, it's Africa, it, you know. And then also our theology of, of uh, missions was sort of that patriarchy, you know, colonialism, which we didn't know at the time, right? Because 
it's all these people who didn't know Jesus. That's why their lives and their societies and their countries were a mess. So once we help them to know Jesus, it all they'll all become like us. Yeah, they'll all we'll be like the U.S. Them. Right? Yeah, that's the big word. Or, or they'll yeah. have you know jobs like, and everyone will be fed. They'll have social services. They'll have social security. Who knows? <laughs> they'll have good police and no corruption. I don't you know. That was sort of the subliminal messages, but. That that's, was my understanding, I think, of the church until much, much later in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think it's important, too. I mean, just the fact that I asked the question growing up in church. I didn't come to Christ until college, but same thing. Have you ever heard a sermon on race in church? And all of us would say no. You know, I mean, I think that says a lot. And I grew up in a similar, uh, like I said, I didn't come to Christ until I came to college. And it was a Korean Southern Baptist church. So even though you're Korean in a Southern Baptist church, it doesn't, it, you're still learning the same gospel that the, um, the white missionaries or whatever, that your white seminary professors taught you, you know? So it's, it's the same thing. There was, um, uh, when it came to social issues, that was the government's work. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's not important, but it's the government's work. It's not the gospel work. The gospel work is still more important than the government work and the gospel work is like we need to tell people about Jesus and get them into heaven. So there was no theological, um, there was no theological teeth for engaging anything social. Like homelessness, no. Like, again, it was for the church, I mean for the, uh, the government to do, yeah. Um, and, yeah. Any of these social ills, welfare, poverty, that's, you could be nice to people and you know go serve in the soup kitchen you know once a year or something like that but those things were still very a far second to preaching and getting mm -hmm. people into heaven yeah yeah so we had no theological basis for yeah and I, I think for me is like th this question of what is gospel what is good news right and and that was saving souls right getting them out of hell right getting fire insurance and not necessarily saving them into something good like the kingdom kingdom of god right and so i think for me my faith was a, a lot about having a privatized individualized faith as long as i was good with god as long as my personal piety was good with god i'm set you know that's all and so i think in a lot of ways why to your question why have asian american christians and churches missed out and why are they silent in part, it's because they don't know any different. As long as if you see racism and race as an individual personal thing, like our faith teaches us mm -hmm. to do, mm -hmm. you're not going to see systems and structures. And so we don't learn that in our theology, because our theology is about a gospel of individualism, right? What is your relationship with God? What is your relationship, your personal relationship with Christ? And so... I think in some ways we as, as Asian American churches have to get out. We have to be more curious in what God is doing in the world today, how God is moving, and these be more curious about these different theologies such that we ask the question, what really is good news? If that's what gospel is, which you know in, in the Greek is euangelion, right? Good news. What really is good news to us? Um, I think... Asian American churches and Christians got to ask those questions and, and, and be open to the, to the possibility that it would open us up to thinking differently systemically and structurally. Then I think we have an opportunity to, to undo some of these things that we, or I, let me put it in the positive, to be involved with some of these things that we've been so silent upon. But I mean, in some ways, we're silent because we're doing the very things that we've been taught, and that is to have a personal relationship with, with Christ. And so that's we true. do, and that's it. I think that's a, a big aha moment, because I, I think that's a big aha moment for me as well, yeah. because what we were taught is that it's a relationship. If everyone had a relationship with God, yeah. then there would be justice. Yeah. There would be right. that we can get rid of racism and things right. like that. Um, but then, so, as it, so that means it was on an individual level. But yeah, we, we never had this idea that racism and sin can also be, it's more than just individual. It can be corporate yep. sin. It's there could be, there could be yep. yeah, it, it could be systemic. Yep. And so once you start thinking those terms, then you're like, oh, yeah. that's the aha moment. If we don't address that or if we have no language 
theolog theology to address that, yeah. then yeah, we don't have anything that we can contribute to the conversation. And that's not to say that our personal relationship with God and Christ is not important. It very much is, but you don't have to have, it's not, it's not binary thinking. It's mm -hmm. not either this or this. It's both of these because that's what God is about, at least in my theology, right? That, that the kingdom of God is about flourishing of all creation and all create, created, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think that probably goes back into the way of just, you could, you could talk about, we, because the United States is so, we're known for our individualism, our rugged individualism, our independence, um, and that seeps into the way that we interpret scripture. Mm -hmm. So that we interpret so much of scripture as, it, as an individual empowerment story yeah. that we can live into um, versus seeing the bigger structures that the gospel is actually addressing. Yeah, yeah we, we miss that because we only see the individual part. Yeah, and, and the individualism plays also into what's called meritocracy thinking, which is very much a part of American philosophy, but then also, more specifically, it's seeped into, I think, American evangelicalism, right? So meritocracy is the idea that you get what you deserve. And so if you start at the, be at the end, and you see black lives poor or whatever upheaval in chaos, then you work it backwards and say, therefore, they did not do something along the way. Right? And, and again, you're not seeing structural thinking necessarily. I think part of it also, it just shows like, I do think that, you know, Christ, he transforms lives unless we hold culture or cultural things up as a, an idol. And so I do think that for Asians in particular, the structure, the, we've, Asian Americans in general have been allowed to succeed at a certain level and have been allowed to uh, be included at a certain level. And I think it, is, it works for Asians in this country. And I think because of that... Um, it works to keep our heads down? It Sorry, works it, it, to not disrupt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because why disrupt the status quo when for the most part it works? Yeah. And so I don't think that's the Christian view, but I think you can see that our collective sin allows that to um, dampen the gospel. So I do feel like as we're, we're Christian above everything else, but we're also Asian. But I think because culture really plays a huge impact on who we are as human beings, we allow that to, we allow it to dampen the message of Christ, his heart for justice. And so I think as Asians, I think we allow, we allow the cultural part of being Asian um, and knowing that we have been given a certain amount of ability to succeed and be prosperous. And so um, I do think that it's our own sinfulness where we allow ourselves to not address injustice because, I mean, it's true, like in, in all the messages, you know, as we're like studying now, especially in the wake of George Floyd and all of that, people are like, oh, you know, opening their eyes to all of these places in the Bible that Jesus, you know, led around justice, his heart for justice. And it's like, have these passages been here all this time? But, you know, we just don't talk about, you know, a lot of that. But I think part of it is because it doesn't serve the purpose. Like, it's, um, it was things that we didn't need to address because the system works, I think, mm -hmm. for the model minority. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been allowed, a, granted a certain level of access to resources and things like that. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that influences our, us as Asian Christians. I think that we're starting to come out of that. Like I think we're starting to let some of the, the smog kind of clear out and things like that. I think COVID has helped because we've been forced to like face some of these things. Um, but th that's what I would say. I mean, I think that that, and I also think some of it's like what we said earlier around culture. We, 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 this is kind of the intersection of some of the Asian cultural values of harmony, keeping your head down, you know, um, you, you know, you, we are respectful to authority and things like that. That comes into, I, I think it intersects with some of the, even things that are taught in the Bible around not going up against sure. Caesar. Yeah, being you know, submissive Being submissive, yeah, like God puts, yeah. you know, 
he puts all these people in power for a reason, and so we need to be submissive and respectful. So some of these things all come together. Uh, but for us, I think that's particularly why Asian churches have been quiet. But I also agree with you around, I think a lot of the Asian churches have been developed and influenced by the white church. And I think we just can't deny that the, the white church has promoted um, racism and segregation for since the beginning of the American church. I mean, I don't, was there ever a time when the church wasn't segregated? I think another, something to add to that too is because of our immigration story, um, you know, most of us maybe were, a lot of us are just one or two generations away from poverty, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, and my grandparents came to Hawaii and they were dirt poor in, you know, Hiroshima, you know, <laughs> and they came for a, a better life. So, so when we would read things in the Bible about the poor being oppressed, mm -hmm. we, I had two pictures. One were the real poor in Africa who had no food, like the, you know, severely uh, poor, uh, or like where we came from, right? And so it wasn't until more, you know, my later adult years when I would read passages about people being oppressed, you know, and, and the prophets and things like that. And I realized, I'm the rich. I'm, mm. I'm the oppressor. And I'm mm. thinking, when did that happen? When did I come from the oppressed mm -hmm. to the oppressor? And that was really hard for me to see that, right? Because we, you're just scraping away. I mean, your grandparents scraped away. In some ways, our parents had it easier, you know, made a better life for us, right? So this whole thing, we, we're, we're just one or two generations from... You know, I mean, my, my grandfather was known as the champion rat catcher. And I, and I just grew up knowing that. And finally, I would be like, what's that about? Well, in Hawaii, in the sugarcane fields, they would give a bonus every Christmas mm. to the person who catch, could catch the most rats mm. in the sugarcane fields. And my grandfather always would win that prize, so he would have extra money for the family, mm. you know? And so, I mean, we're just, I'm, you know, I'm two generations <laughs> from the rat catchers. So... So then all of, a sudden to, all of a sudden I'm, you know, have, you know, education, I have money, I have influence. How did that happen, right? And all of a sudden I'm reading scripture and I'm the 1%, right? I'm the oppressor. I'm the fat cow. And it's just, it's just yeah. you know, getting your head wrapped around that. And okay, so what do you guys think is... Uh a pathway that we could, Asian Americans can find our voice again in this discussion on race? I think one is to get knowledgeable, get learned, right? And so what that means is you have to know your history and not just the history that you were taught in school, but you gotta start reading and watching, listening to other, mm -hmm. other histories out there um, because there are many. And so learn and, and, and know your histories. Um, I think getting, you know, I, I listened to Brian Stevenson, right, who there's a movie out, Just Mercy out, but he, before that, his book, and before that, his talks and all the work that he's done. You know, one of the things that he really comes back to is, is get proximate, you know, be close to whatever the issue or the people behind the issues are. And so if, if you need to find that courage to be able to um, muster up that conversation that you've been dreading with um, black communities, black people, black persons that you might know or don't know, do that, right? I mean, that, that's, those are the types of conversations I think that we need or touch points that we need and relationships that we need in order to be able to keep moving forward. I would also say that for Asian Americans in particular, um, and this is, gets, gets to my understanding of what race and racism is or racial oppression is, and it's not just individual one-to-one, -one, I think, as, as one of us was saying, right? But there is the ideological, there's the institutional, which I understand as <laughs> a systemic, mm -hmm. and then there's the individual, but then I think there's a fourth one, and that is the, the internal our internal racism and oppression. So I think as Asian Americans, we really have to um, 
work on what is the internal oppression that I have within me that makes me keep coming back to distancing myself from other people who are also racially oppressed. And so if like growing up, if I could tell the funniest jokes about Asian Americans, about Korean Americans, then I could say to my other friends, see, I'm not like that person. I'm like one of you, right? And so there's this othering that happens that for me. And so I think for Asian Americans, we have to ask ourselves really the question like, how are we doing with our own internalized racism such that we cannot, or if, if in the positive, if we deal with our internalized racism better and oppression better, maybe then we can come into this relationship with a black person in a much more healthy way than if we were holding that racialized oppression and then begin to project onto that person some of whatever our own internalized oppression is and racism is. So, you know, there's a lot of, I think, self-awareness work, a lot of internal work that we have to do, um, but, it's, but it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. I would say that those, uh, those are a couple of steps, I think, for us to kind of move forward as an as a Asian American Christian community. Yeah, that's good. And I think what I, what's great in, I mean, I think I know your church is really involved with, like, Kimball Elementary. Yeah. Obviously, your church with, with Beacon Hill Elementary and, and Jubilee Reach and uh, you know, you with Lighthouse. Um, I, I think it's it's good to see that so many churches, especially Asian, Asian American churches, are trying to be more um, embedded in their community so that relationships don't have to be just purely, you know, homogeneous. I think, a, I think another issue we have to deal with, I think, is our fears. Mm. You know, when I think about racism, uh, prejudice, I think if you go if you go deep, I think a lot of it has to do with fears. You know, like uh, Kelly was saying earlier, part of the Asian American experience is if I stick my head out, right, then, you know, the Japanese saying that the nail get, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the nail that sticks out gets pounded down, right? So you just lay low, don't make waves, hope you're invisible, <laughs> you know, so you don't get in trouble. And so there's a fear that all the things that I, we have gained as a community, as a family, as individuals, I can lose it all, right? Right, right. If and I say the wrong thing, if I back the wrong person, if, if, if I get attacked, and then I put not just myself at risk, but my family at risk, my church at risk, my community at risk, right? Because we're very tied into our community. You know, that's, a, that's another Asian thing, right? Whatever I do, reflects on my whole family community, right? If I, if I, you know, go to get arrested, oh my gosh, right? My whole family, you know, shamed, right? Shame-based culture. But so where does that fear come? Is it a fear of, of shaming my family? You know, is it a fear of putting my family at risk? Is it a fear of losing the, whatever I have worked so hard, my parents have worked so hard to gain for me? Right, and so you have to say, what am I willing to sacrifice? Right, what am I willing to give up? What am I willing to die to? And that only, I mean, the strength of that will, is what comes from our faith in, in God. Otherwise, what would motivate us to lose everything to, for the sake of someone else? Gee, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds you know? like scripture. It sounds <laughs> like know? Philippians too. Right? Yeah. And, 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 so, and it's not only individual. We all have to do it. Because if I do it, I put you at risk. So we have to collectively say, mm. and we do this as a church, right? As a church, we say, are we willing to do this as a church? Because it's not just what Nancy says. No, no. Right? I represent our church. Mm -hmm. You know, so we all have to all be in an agreement saying, are we willing to be seen this way? Are we willing to be judged this way? Are we willing for people to say these things about us? You know, Amen. and so, you know, we have, so that's that, that fear. But also there's a fear, you know, in terms of African-American community. You know, we are by stature, small people. <laughs> And I am a small yeah, person, <laughs> you know, and again, as an Asian woman, right, um, small, um, I'm afraid of a lot of people, you know, when they do those little um, tests, you know, or, you know, if you have a 
white face or a black face, you know, if it's a male face, it's the same. Okay? <laughs> I'm just as afraid of the black face as a white face and maybe an Asian face. Who knows, right? And for us, we're always aware. We're always fearful, right? But you go to the Asian male, though, it's a little bit different psyche, right? To have fear, you know, of the, the other and um, protection of your family and, and things like that, right? Which, as a woman, we don't, we just try to survive ourselves, you know? But, but, but you know, there's that fear. And so I feel like um, often, um, like, like women live with those fears every day we are aware of who's in the room, who's around us, right? But I think Asian males or males in general, sometimes your awareness is who's bigger than me, who's more powerful than me, who can, who's a threat to me, right? But in a different, in a different way. And so sometimes people who have power, whether it's physical power or, you know, economic power or whatever, they're seen as threats. So why would I help someone who can now hurt me? Right. Why would I go out of my way and put my family at risk for someone who can turn around and, 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 and mm -hmm. who's not for me? Mm -hmm. right. So there's mm -hmm. also this insular protectiveness that we have as Asian Americans. Right? We look out for each other because we're the, we're the minority. We're the underdogs in some way. Right? Everyone, we have to protect our own. Mm -hmm. So you circle the wagons. You know, it's like, okay, you're, you're half Japanese. Okay, you can come in. Okay, you're, you're Asian. Okay, you can come in, right? Because it's us against everyone else. And, 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 and that's, that's not biblical, right? That's, that we, we're not here to save ourselves, mm -hmm. right? And so we, we, but that's a huge, that's huge to, to, to come to terms with that and see, are we willing to share what we have? Are we willing to have less? Are we willing to sacrifice? So, okay, so your kids won't be able to go to Ivy League school. Is that okay? <laughs> I mean, don't touch my kids. Don't touch the, re you know, my resources that I'm saving for my kids. But, you know, are we willing to do that? That's, man, that's. Yeah, I'm just kind of struck by, you know, you're talking about, I mean, we're talking about the church and the church being basically sacrificial in that mm -hmm. um, we can't. <laughs> that, there's so much holding us back from actually doing that. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, that is a big piece of that hard look of how do we move forward. Because if, we, if we're not willing to, to count the cost a little bit more and identify what it means, then we'll, we'll just continue perpetuating what we currently have. And that's just not acceptable. You know, we, we, as a church, we, we just have to do better than that. Yeah, I, I mean, I resonate with a lot of what you're saying, Nancy. I mean, I, I do think, um, I think that's where we have hope with the Asian church in particular, because I think stereotypically Asian cultures, there is a value on education, on prosperity, on success. Like, that's pretty much, I mean, it's a stereotype, but a lot of it's from, oh, it's true. yeah, it's true. And so we have that cultural value of being successful and, and, and rising to levels, you know, for our, ourselves, for our children, our children's children. But I do think that as Christians who happen to be Asians, that it is a different calling to be willing to, to leave all of that behind, you know, for the cause, you know, for Jesus and for his heart, for, for the poor. And he always is asking, you have to be able to leave everything. And I think that that, that is what it's going to take for the Asian church is to, we've got cultural differences between our Christian culture and maybe some of our Asian culture around success. And we, we have to be willing to, like you said, we have to be willing to say, I'm willing to give that up to help other people, you know, because fighting against racism, we will lose things. Like I, I, when you see people who stand up and make their voices known and are fighting against racism, um, they get hurt. They, they uh, in in some way, they become marginalized. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a cost to being an anti-racist. So I think as Christians, that's the power, is that God does call us to be willing to give up for his values. And I do think that he values justice. And um, so I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is, um, moving forward, I think that as Asians, we have to unpack this anti-blackness. Like, 
like, I think we all have kind of our own stories of black is bad. That has been taught to us, you know, and I think that we have to, um, we have to own it and unpack where that comes from. And some of it, I think, comes from generation to generation within the Asian culture. Um, but it's, I think it's, it's deeply embedded in the Asian culture, but it's also just embedded in American culture. Like, I, I remember watching My Little Pony with my daughter. Um, I wasn't watching it. I was, she was watching it. I happened to be in the same room. Okay. But um, she, like, even in shows like that, they teach that black is bad. Mm -hmm. Every bad character is black. Almost every single mm -hmm. one is black. The color black. I mean, and then um, I think the way that our society portrays black men, they are portrayed as bad. Um, you know, I think um, when I think about like drugs, you know, when it's black people doing drugs, the response is the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. When white people are doing drugs, it's a health mm -hmm. epidemic crisis. So <laughs> we, we view black as bad. And I think it's, it's reinforced in the church, too, because we talk about sin as black. Black as sin. White, yep. you know, pure white. So we have this imagery of black and white in the Bible, in the church. And I don't think that it's meant to be racialized, but I think that it, you layer that on top of what society says about the goodness and badness of people by color. It matches. It, it, people are conflating the two. And so I think that we as Asians need to unpack when we see something, or especially if someone who's black, and we have a negative association, I think it's good to s stop, notice it, and then be curious about where that came from. You know, so a black person in poverty, or poor, or homeless, we, we look at that negatively. What did that person do? Probably on drugs, not working very hard. Mm -hmm. But you see an Asian person living in poverty or homeless, it's like, what happened to that? Like, yeah. you know, so we view color differently, even if they're in the same situation. So I think unpacking color, I think, is important. The third thing yeah. is, um, I think as Christians, we, I think we will be prone to say, you know, okay, racism, it is, it is bad, it is a sin. And then shift to talking about sin and mm -hmm. saying sin is bad, and so... The, the, uh, the response to sin or the, the solution to sin is Jesus. And I think that as Christians, I think we have to, we have to um, not let ourselves go down that path because I, I think it's important that we continue to call out racism as a specific sin mm -hmm. because then the answer to racism, it is Jesus, but it's also there's a lot of action that comes with, with responding to the sin of racism. So, because what I see is, um, it's like the, I don't know, like the whitewashing of, of the word racism. It's hard for people to say, I'm racist, or we're part of a racist. It's, it's, that word is hard for people, and so it's easier for Christians to say, I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that we have to just be careful about that. As Christians, we need to, we need to stick with the word race and racism, because there are specific actions that come once you confess that particular sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as Christians, we need to be able to say, I'm racist, or yeah. as Christians, you have to say, I have, I have racist thoughts and tendencies or things like that. We have to be able to be that explicit. Yeah, yeah is that what you're saying? Okay. Is there a unique place that Asian Americans have in the racial reconciliation process? You know, I, I think so. I, particularly for me as a Korean American, uh, Korean black relations historically, especially since like the 70s, 80s, uh, around different uh, store owners, right? Yeah. And, then, and then culminating in 1992 with the LA unrest. Um, I think that there definitely is a special place. And it's interesting, I've had conversations more recently with a, with a black colleague and um, he's just firing off. We're just doing this through texting. And he's firing off all these questions like, what's Korean culture like around this, right? And so we're sharing back and forth. And, and I've thought this before, but it, it is becoming more real to me, is how much we actually um, have a lot, in and I want to be careful how I say this, but how we have in common a lot of the faith in collective pieces 
right, between black and Korean. And I would probably venture to say between black and Asian. And so in that sense, I think there is very much a, 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 a natural highway, I guess you could put it, for Asian Americans to be able to step into this work. Unfortunately, and I think ethnic or ethnic, ethnic studies scholars would say this, Asian Americans have been used to pit yeah, between whites and <clears throat> blacks. And as a result of that, we're this buffer people such that, you know, we are called the model, model minority by whites. And that is resented, I think, in a lot of ways, yeah. and rightfully so. And so we have to be able to see that. And I think we do have a, a really good place of saying, look, we, we, have a, we have a lot that we can share. I don't want to maybe say, maybe I'll backtrack on in common, but we have a lot that we can share, uh, of a lot of building blocks that we can share together in order to be able to do this racial reconciliation. And so do we have a place in this? Absolutely. And um, I think it's a gift in terms of what we, this opportunity that we have before us. Yeah, I think so too. I think with the relation with the black community, because to be able to kind of, historically confess those things of yeah. how we've yeah, pitted ourselves against blacks. And then at the same time to, because we have this adjacency to the white culture, to, um, to be friends, to, to help them, help bring them along in a, in a sense, yeah. you know? Um, so, so take that buffer, whatever that is, I mean, right. even though it's been used negatively, right. take that, that bridge building, I think, uh, position, uh, to be able to do some of this good work, I think, mm -hmm. as, as I think as you're pointing out. Mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Yeah, I would say something uh, similar. This whole thing about being sort of that honorary white, but yet mm -hmm. perpetual for perpetual foreigner. We're kind of like both the both and. Um, but also, I think we can speak into some of these racial tensions um, because, for one thing, there in some ways we're sort of semi-neutral party, right? Like we weren't as complicit in the whole uh, slavery and, mm -hmm. you know, civil rights times because we were here. <laughs> we had our own issues. Um, and so when we speak into that, like you said, we're not a threat, you know, to either side. And yet we can identify with the oppressed people because we understand that. Right. I mean, I remember talking to, uh, mm -hmm. I used to be part of a, a big white church, <laughs> right? Right? and they wanted to become multi-ethnic, mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, but they didn't understand that they, they had a culture, you know, and so I would talk, I had to talk to them about culture. What is culture? They, they thought, well, this is, they would say, oh, you know, when we, when people come to Christ, we want them to raise their hand and want them to stand up and come forward. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's not going to work for my people. <laughs> you know, because they're like, well, you know, if you want it, you should be stand up and, you know, make a statement. And, I, and they go, that's the, that's the Christian way. And I would say, well, that's the white Christian way. Okay. You know, or I, I would always want refreshments and food. And they're like, Nancy, what is it about you? food? Okay, we'll have coffee. But I go, you gotta have snacks. And they're like, what's, what's, I go, you want the Asian people to come, the Hispanic people come, and the African American people, you gotta have food, dude, okay? <laughs> this is our culture, right? So they're just not aware. So we can, you know, be that bridge or educate about some of the injustices. But the other thing is, I feel like, at least as a, you know, kind of that Japanese American heritage, there's two things that I identify with for me personally. One is immigration issues. And that's because of the internment camps, you know. So when you see these detention centers, mm -hmm. you know, again, they used to call them camps, okay. Mm -hmm. It's jail, you know, just like the detention center. These are jails, right? And you're thinking, who's making a profit? Well, mm -hmm. somebody's making a profit off of gathering all the undocumented people, just like people made a profit. And it wasn't about safety, you know, in, in the internment camps. It was people wanting the property and, and you know, and oppressing uh, the Japanese American people. The second thing is this, uh, you know, I think about, and I didn't know this, so this is all learned for me, right, since I, when I was in college, about how land was stolen. Mm -hmm. 
right? So you have people now who they could be multimillionaires, right? These families because they had land in LA, <laughs> you know, the Bay Area, you know, that was mm -hmm. stolen, and now other people are millionaires and because of that, right? But when you think of the African American experience, their lives were stolen, right? And so generations of having everything stolen from you. So we can identify with those things. And, and I think of the reparations that were made, it was small, it was token, but the government apologized and made reparations. Well, where are the reparations for the African American? Mm -hmm. Right, where is the, you know, where is, us, where is the attempt to admit these egregious acts mm -hmm. and to try to make amends or to lift up a people that were oppressed? Where is that, right? And so since we experienced some of that, a touch of that reparations in a very small period of time, we understand those things. So we can speak mm -hmm. into those things mm -hmm. and say it wasn't even about the money. It was about admitting what we did was terribly, terribly unjust, right? And so can we now, you know, speak for other people because of what we've experienced? And it's just interesting when a lot of the immigration issues came in and, you know, even um, uh, violence against Muslims and, you know, uh, people from the Middle East, that is when the Japanese Americans who were yes, incarcerated, mm -hmm. they That's came right. out, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And they said never, Never again. Never, never again. again. <laughs> who never spoke to their families, who never said anything. It was so shameful, they put it behind them. They came out and they said, did we, how have we forgotten? Yeah. Right? So that's what we, one of the things we can do, yeah. I think, is to speak out because we know. I, I think for me, um, you know, I've been reading about, uh, with George Floyd's death, you know, one of the police officers was Asian, you know, Asian American, the Hmong. Um, and so there's lots of conversations about model minority and about his role. And it's so complicated because the Hmong have also a very difficult past and, you know, with you know, coming here after the war and all of that stuff. But I do think as Asian Americans, we have a moral choice. You know, we either, you know, stand in solidarity with black or we're complicit to the crimes that are committed against black. I mean, it, it, no matter how much suffering our family has endured or we've endured, when it comes down to it, we may not be in a situation like that with police, but it's, it, we're in that situation, whether it's in church or in education or in the medical field or wherever, in every, I think, aspect of our society, we're standing there, we have that choice. Like, are we, are we gonna be complicit to what's happening to other people? Or are we going to stand in solidarity with them? And so um, I, I think Asian Americans, we do, um, we, have to, we have to make that choice. Because um, if we choose to be silent, then we're complicit. Because we're allowed to have some level of prosperity in this country. Because I, when I think about the reparations, I, I, I've been thinking about that a lot too. It's like, why would the government pay reparations to the Japanese Americans, when with what happened in Tulsa, you know, to the whole African American community, there's no reparations there, or to you know, like why why reparations for an an Asian group? And I just think, um, what what we can't as like as particularly for Japanese Americans is we can't take the money and then be quiet. Mm -hmm. Like it can't be silence money to then say, okay, yep. we're in. So we'll keep our mouths shut about everybody else. I mean, just because that happened, there's still, a, um, I think, a calling for Asian Americans to, to then fight for other people for the same type of reparation for injustices that happen. Um, and then I do think, I think a lot of Asians are in positions of influence because we're the, considered the model minority. So we've got to hire somebody, you know, um, who, who's not white, <laughs> So I think a lot of Asian people are in positions of influence and are considered kind of allies, non-disruptors. But I think because of that, I was talking to my wife about this and she was reminding me like, that is an opportunity to speak in. So it's, it's like what you guys have been saying about like, you know, to be that ally, but 
to be a kind of a critical ally to say like this needs to happen these things need to change mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 it sounds like the i mean we're we're getting the consensus here is like we have to speak up like yeah. there, we have to use our voice um we we can't just keep continue remaining that that silent person that complicit yeah that's, that was great i mean silence money hush money right it's not hush yeah. money it's justice money right that we have to continue on i, I really like that good yeah I, I am really proud of the the japanese americans who were incarcerated who stood up after 9 11 mm. and said like the racism towards muslims cannot happen yeah like we cannot go down that road again, you know, no. because it there was just so many parallels. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're saying. Okay. It, it's kind of interesting too because once um, your eyes are open to some of these issues and how it intersects with our theology, when we go back to God's word, when we go back to Scripture, we see it everywhere, everywhere. right? You think yeah. of you know Acts two and the the food, mm -hmm. you know, Eater. going yeah. not going to the <clears throat> Hellenistic widows yep. what is that about <laughs> you know when you think about the jew and gentile conflict and how you know the gentiles you know to follow jesus had to become jews right they have to adopt yep. our culture and our way of living i mean you know on and on and so it's it, it's there when you think of um god's uh condemnation of kings it was because of injustice yeah. because of they're turning, you know, the rich staying rich and the poor getting poor. I mean, this is all, all over scripture, but we just didn't know it was there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, or we just, we, yeah. I, oh, another thing we did to kind of whitewash that was we spiritualized it. Yep. Yes. The poor were the, not physically poor, yep. but the poor, poor in, in spirit. spirit. <laughs> right. Yep. right, so we just, we're all poor in spirit. Not certain yeah. people are poor, right. but all people are poor in spirit right. and so um we're all the, so we have to address and, that and issue. jesus himself tried to try to teach us when you give up you know a yeah. cup of water <laughs> right yeah. to to someone in my name you know when you when you you know you know feed the hungry right yeah. when you release the prisoners yeah. right isaiah 61 but you know, we we just didn't we spiritualized it like you said i always think it's so interesting that the the gospel litmus test uh, was when you get to heaven mm -hmm. someone's going to ask you why mm -hmm. should I allow you into heaven St. Peter or you know and the correct answer is because I put my faith in Jesus Christ like mm -hmm. that was a litmus test mm -hmm. for getting to heaven but when you look at Matthew 25 mm -hmm. not that there is a litmus test but Matthew 25 mm -hmm. the litmus test is did you feed the poor yeah yeah mm -hmm. did you visit the people in prison you know mm -hmm. um, yeah. it has everything to do with like the work that you did, mm -hmm. that demonstrated your faith, mm -hmm. you know? But the, yeah, again, what we grew up, I grew up in was, let me say, like, just that belief that, mm -hmm. did you have that faith? Like, that's it, yeah. you know? Or did you, did you pray the sinner's prayer? Yeah. You know? And, and again, I think we do have to deal with our sin. Yeah, absolutely. And specifically in this conversation, around our sin, around racism towards mm -hmm. black people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and being complicit in a racist system in a structure that perpetuates injustice towards black people, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was just that. Or can you pray the sinner's prayer and that's it? Yeah. Yeah, is there a particular scripture verse that God is speaking to you these days when it, when it comes, or is there a particular verse that maybe you, you go to when you teach about these things? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's um, I mean, the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor. And... Um, Especially with the way when I mean the way that Jesus explains like who the neighbor is I think the Good Samaritan story is I, I think one of his most powerful like examples of like What it means to be a neighbor who's a neighbor and then the fact that he uses the Samaritan as the hero of the story So he's already bringing race into mm -hmm. kind of the story, but he doesn't use The Samaritan as the victim who needs to be helped by somebody else but he uses the the one who is hated as the hero of the story and i just think jesus is just his his vision is really amazing when you think about the neighbor and so i'm like to me that's the most important thing god says to love him and to love our neighbor and he's really clear about our neighbors are not just the people who live 
in our kind of segregated neighborhoods that are right next to us, but it is people who are different than us, who might be a different religion than us, different race than us, people who we culturally might despise. Like those, those are the neighbors, you know, um, that, he's, that he's talking about. So. I think, um, well, one of the scripture that comes to my mind is, um, you know, when, uh, when uh, John the Baptist is in prison, right, and he hears about Jesus, and, and he, he, he doubts, right, and so he sends his followers and asks Jesus, you know, are you the one, right, are you the one that we've been waiting for? And Jesus says, well, look, the blind see, the lame walk, right, there's, there's a flourishing that comes to all people, right, to the least of these, right, and when there's flourishing, that's a sign that the, he is from heaven, he is the real thing, that this is God's purposes for the, for the poor to be lifted up, for the weak to be strengthened, for the, you know, sick to be healed, and that's a sign, you know, so when we go out and we say, well, we're about the gospel, we're the good news, can people see the good news? You know, I don't want to separate, you know, social issues, social services from the gospel, but there are signs, right, when, when people are living into the love of Christ and, and the hope we have in Christ and the forgiveness and the newness of life, it should free us and heal us in such a way that we reach out so that other people can experience that healing and forgiveness, and if and if our hearts are changed, then society will change. But they're the both and. So when we see, like, if you think, oh, you know, is 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 the church reflecting Christ's love today? Well, look, there's no poor in our city. Well, look, the African Americans are flourishing. Well, look, Muslim people are sitting and having dinner with our Christian family. What do you see? Right. I think for me, uh, lately I've been coming back to a, a passage in Galatians, right, uh, that I heard growing up a lot around um, kind of this colorblind rhetoric. Uh, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. And, um, you know, I think, the way that I've always heard that was, so therefore, well, I don't see Jew, I don't see Greek, I don't see any of these things, or Gentile, Jew or Gentile, and so forth. But the reality is that there will still remain Jew, there still remain Gentile, there still remain male, female, right, and so forth. So Paul, in that passage, what he was doing was he was saying, he wasn't working on the differences, he was, work, he was working on the differentials. And he was saying, because you are in Christ, therefore Jew and Gentile can meet together. Male and female can meet together. Free and slave can meet together. Whereas before Christ, there was this hierarchy of relations. Right? Jew was over Gentile, uh, male over female, free over slave. And and, and what Paul's doing in that passage is saying, no, because you are in Christ, you are now to come at, to the table together. So I, I take that as, especially around race, is we need to deal with the differentials, not the differences. Because those different, I, I'm going to continue to, as far as I know, continue to be Korean, <laughs> right? For the rest of my life. My black friends are going to continue to be black. But what does that mean socially, you know, in our society? That is what I have to work on. That, I think that's what Paul was doing. And so I, I've been coming back to that passage more. And so therefore, I need to see color. I need to see the black man, the black woman in what their, their context is today, and that is in the U.S. context. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to be a black man, a black woman, right, uh, in today's society? And for me then to work on those differentials that what that that mm -hmm. social location brings. Mm -hmm. That's that, good. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks guys so much. It's been really rich. Uh, just for me. I hope it's been really 
just rich for me just to hear these voices have an, have an Asian panel. Um, thanks for, thanks so much for having this conversation, being open and honest, and also just for, for our church, so that our church can, can listen to it. Because um, I know it's been, we, we've been doing this as a church, and this is really, this continues to help us take that next step um, towards repentance and, and being agents of reconciliation. Yeah, thanks so much. So Mark, would you close us in prayer? Would you, would you do that? That'd be great. Loving God, we come before you at the end of this time, just really thankful, humbled by your goodness to us, by your truth that you speak and you knock hard on each of our hearts. God, I thank you for the truth and the wisdom that's in this room and that has been shared. And I pray, God, that um, this conversation wouldn't just cease here but that it would compel us and propel us to do more and to be people who are um, working for your kingdom and for the flourishing of all creation. I pray specifically for our black brothers and sisters right now, the black community who aches and mourns and is hurting. And I pray your healing hand upon them that you would help to bring justice, that you help to bring healing, and that you would help to bring flourishing to each of the lives and to the communities. God, where we have, we as an Asian American community, Asian American Christians have fallen short, and as we have been complicit in the system, we pray for your forgiveness. We pray that we would not continue down this path hurting our black brothers and sisters. So God, we thank you for this time, and we thank you for this gathering. And may this word um, here tonight continue to go out and be good news to all people. For it's in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. You take our lives, flawed yet beautiful, restore, refine, Lord, you're merciful, redeem. Christ be known.
ourselves again. Lord, would you hear our cry? Lord, will you heal our land? That every eye will see, that every heart will know. The one who took our sin, the one who died and arose. So God, we pray to you, humble ourselves Christ alone. 